Good morning and can I welcome everyone to the sixth meeting in 2021 of the Social Security Committee. We have got no apologies this morning. Uh, and before we move to agenda item one, can I just uh, remind committee members there's a lot of subordinate legislation to get through this morning. We're considering instruments in turn, child on child with assist, disability assistance, on data sharing and then on operating. So we now move to agenda item one, subordinate legislation. Uh, this is the evidence session on the Disability Assistance for Children and Young People Scotland Regulations 2021. These regulations are subject to the affirmative procedure. Can I refer members to paper one, the note by the clerk, and paper two by Spice? And can I welcome Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, and her officials, David George, Disability Benefits Policy Team Leader, Scottish Government. Kirsten Simone Lefefre, Principal Legal Officer, Scottish Government, and David Hilber, Case Transfer Policy Lead, Scottish Government. Um, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement, and then we'll move to questions. Thank you very much, Convener. I'm delighted to be able to be here to talk about the regulations for child disability payment. CDP will be the first regularly recurring disability benefit to be delivered by Social Security Scotland, and it will make a significant contribution to the lives of disabled people and disabled children and young people in Scotland, their families and their carers. We remain on track to deliver child disability payment in 2021, beginning with a summer pilot for new applications in Perth and Ross, Dundee City and the Western Isles. In the autumn, we plan to accept new applications from children all over Scotland, as well as children who live abroad with a genuine sufficient link to Scotland. We have extensively um, co-designed the application process with people with lived experience of the current system and will accept applications by phone, online, on paper or face-to-face. -face. Our new digital service will allow applicants to complete the form at their own pace, which is a significant improvement over the paper-based forms offered in the current system. We will have local delivery staff in all local authority areas to provide pre-application advice and support, as well as support with the application process itself. We will not require any child or young person to undergo a face-to-face -face assessment. Our focus instead will be to help applicants to collect supporting information so that we can make robust, fair decisions. Awards of Child Disability Payment will be rolling awards. They will not have an end date, but will be subject to review. This ensures there is no cliff edge for families and an award continues during any review. Reviews will be light touch and designed to minimise stress for children and families. Our review process has been extensively tested with people with lived experience of the current social security system. Any young person who is entitled to CDP immediately prior to age 16 will have their award automatically extended to 18 to avoid the need to apply for personal independence payment. Families have repeatedly emphasised to us how unhelpful it is for young people to have to transfer to PIP at age 16, especially at a time when they are moving between health and social care services for children and adults. As with people CDP will have two components, a care and mobility component. We have broadly aligned the existing criteria with DLE, but where we can make improvements, we have thought to do so. For children who sadly have a terminal illness, we have removed the restrictive requirement that death must reasonably be expected within six months. Instead, doctors and registered nurses will use their clinical judgment in accordance with guidance published by the Chief Medical Officer to provide supporting information confirming their diagnosis. This will help to ensure that we process applications quickly and sensitively without the need to complete a full application for child disability payment. We will also ensure that children and young people in legal detention can continue to receive the mobility component to allow families to maintain crucial contact and be ready for the return home. We have also modernised the requirement for children with a visual disability so that it now reflects clinical best practice for assessing the vision of children and young people. In doing this, we have engaged with the clinical leads for the Visual Impairment Network for Children and Young People, and we have sought to align with the criteria for other devolved concessions or passported entitlements for children with a severe visual disability. The regulations also make provision for the case transfer process. This includes moving the administration of disability benefits for children and young people in Scotland from the Department of Work and Pensions to Social Security Scotland. 
It also provides for ending disability living allowance awards of these children and young people beginning their entitlement to child disability payment. This is the first time we will be transferring benefits in this week. Clients will not have to make a new application as part of this process. Clients will receive the same rates and components of CDP as they receive for disability living allowance and will be paid on the same schedule. We aim to complete case transfer quickly, but we will not risk the process for uh, being anything other than safe and secure. I remain grateful to Dr Sally Witcher and the Scottish Commission on Social Security for their scrutiny of these regulations. I am also grateful to the many individuals, organisations and stakeholders who have helped us constructively during this process. I welcome the opportunity to assist the committee in their deliberations today. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That that's helpful. We'll move to questions now. First question from Keith Brown, MSP. The approach that's been taken with Social Security Scotland and the Scottish Government has been a very careful and measured one to avoid um, any mistakes, especially when transferring people across. What safeguards have been put in place uh, against any mistakes made in the transfer process, not least given the implications for somebody if they are subject to that mistake in transfer? Well, the case transfer process is a very complex process. As I said in my opening remarks, it is the first time that we will be undertaking um, this work. But when we look at who will be transferring, it is, in essence, um, a, a simple to see that it will be by postal code um, in Scotland. and Therefore, um, we should very easily be able to determine who is and is not um, um, applicable for case transfer. However, we have, of course, ensured that there are safeguards in place. So, if a client has been transferred um, in error, we can carry out a redetermination of their initial CDP determination. And if it's been found out that that determination was incorrect, for example, because they weren't ordinarily resident in Scotland, then um, this can be changed and it effectively undoes the original determination. We are working closely with the DWP to ensure that this um, is a seamless process uh, to ensure that the client is then picked back up immediately um, for child uh, DLE. If the client um, believes that they should have been transferred and they have not been, then they can, of course, notify either Social Security Scotland directly um, or the Department and Work and Pensions, and we will look actively at every case that comes in. And I would also say that we are, of course, very keen to ensure that there is um, um, a high uh, degree of knowledge around uh, stakeholders and interested networks around this to ensure that people know that this is happening, that this is coming, um, that the agency will be transferring cases. And we hope by very proactively um, doing our work with stakeholders, as we do with all our benefits, uh, that we would ensure that mistakes don't arise. But when we do, I hope I've reassured the committee that we do have uh, safeguarding in place uh, to deal with those issues. Hey. Thanks. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that information. I just wonder, though, can you put into context how big an operation this is, um, say, compared to other ones? How many cases, for example, do the Scottish Government propose to select for transfer in the first full year of rollout, and how that compares with previous operations? Well, as I said, um, th this is the first time that we will be undertaking um, case transfer. Obviously, there have been case transfers within DWP um, previously from one benefit to another. Um, it would be fair to say some of them have went more smoothly than others. So we're trying very hard uh, to learn any lessons from that and to ensure that we make it as easy as possible. For example, not require them, them to have an application form, um, which people obviously do if they're um, transferring over to universal credit, for example. In essence, um, we will be transferring just over 50,000 cases of disability living allowance to, to child disability payment. We do plan to complete the um, vast majority of those cases within the first 12 months of national launch, but I would absolutely um, reaffirm our commitment to a safe and secure transition. So if it needs to go slightly slower than that at the start, then we will do that because it is vitally important that people uh, people's um, payments are protected and they're reassured about that. Of course, if we could accelerate the process, we'll, we'll obviously um, do that as well. And I think the other important aspect around case transfer is that we'll clearly communicate 
uh, the case transfer process with the clients. So the client will know um, if their case is about to be transferred, they will be uh, communicated through that process um, and obviously communicated when the process has ended. So we will ensure that the client is fully aware of what's happening with their case um, and is reassured during that process as well, because um, we do know that this could be a worrying time, uh, but we are very, very satisfied that what we've put in place um, once this has begun will reassure people that um, there is nothing that they have to do as part of that process, and that we are absolutely determined to protect that safe and secure transition, as are the DWP, I'm sure. Okay, that's great. Thanks uh, to the Cabinet Secretary for that response, and that's all the questions I have at this point, Convener. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. We'll move to our Deputy Convener, Pauline McNeill. Um, first, can I uh, welcome um, a number of the crucial additions in these regulations, particularly the automatic um, continuation of the benefit we award from uh, age 16 to 18, um, and the arrangements for application by phone or face uh, or face to face. I think are really in excellent um, provisions. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the incorporation of case law into the decision making. So we heard quite a bit from witnesses last week where we know there's been a careful balance struck between um, where you can put succinctly case law into the definitions where possible, but where it's not possible, um, then the definitions have mirrored the language in the DLE regulations. Um, so, my, so there's been one notable difference, and that is in relation to the language between the difference at night and throughout the night. So I wondered if that was intentional to phrase it that way, or could that be changed to match the DLE regulations? Um, and we assume that it's government's you know, intention to, to mirror DLE in case law and in the definition or not? Uh, so, with reference to this specific issue around the um, at night and throughout um, the the night, um, the wording um, has been expressed um, somewhat differently. Um, but there is absolutely no intention to diverge from the existing DLE provision. It is simply a different way of expressing the same principle. And we will certainly set that clearly out for case managers um, in their guidance that this rule should apply in the same way that the equivalent DLE provision um, is, is, is already um, completed by case managers. Thank you. That is really helpful. Just one other question on that. It would it be the intention, therefore, to incorporate any future case law into the regulations? <clears throat> so I suppose rather than giving a blanket answer, I think we have to look at this on a case by case um, basis to establish whether it requires a change in regulations or whether um, any future decisions can um, be dealt with adequately uh, just through an, an update on a, an, a guidance. So. Um, I guess it would be premature to, to say uh, one way or the other about how that would be dealt with. Um, but we do have um, systems in place that obviously monitor uh, what would happen in Scotland, um, but also um, systems in place to monitor the tribunal decisions um, in the rest of the UK um, as well. And that is part of our continuing approach to ensure that we have a safe and secure transition and that we are aware of not just what is happening in Scotland, but what is happening in the rest of um, the UK. And um, Therefore, we will look at all of that on a case-by-case -case basis. If it does need to come back in regulations, we will absolutely do that. If it can be done um, in guidance, um, then that can be done. And through all of this, of course, we'll have a very, very close working relationship with our stakeholders, uh, and um, we do work closely with them so that we can determine their views also on how these things should be dealt with. We might not necessarily agree with them all the time, but I think it's important as we go through this process that we've had a, a really close relationship with stakeholders as we've developed these regulations, and that won't stop if committee passes these regulations today. That will obviously continue as they're put into practice, and we're working through um, how they work and also how flexible, um, if indeed they do have to be flexible, in terms of changes uh, following any case law change. Can we just have a very quick follow up, if that's okay? Yep. Would, would it be fair, Cabinet Secretary, then, if um, there was a significant departure in case law, that a future committee 
um, and it will mean it wasn't adopted into the regulations that our future committee and the future cabinet secretary, um, that the committee could raise that with the government as to why there was a, or to establish the reason for any significant departure in new case law if the if the regulations weren't adjusted to adopt the new case law. Well, I'd certainly expect any future committee to to um, to question what what happens in the future to to ensure that we're we're living up to um, what I, what I've spoken about um, today, and for any cabinet secretary to be able to come forward um, and and to determine that. I mean, obviously, we welcome the scrutiny of the, the committee in this because we want to get this right. We want to be able to reassure the committee, the stakeholders, and most importantly, the people um, who receive uh, these payments that we're dealing with this fairly and that we are listening and adapting um, where necessary. So I would think that would be a, a very important role um, that uh, the committee, stakeholders, etc., would play in the future to make sure that we're having that level of scrutiny as we go forward. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Jeremy Balfour. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Can I just follow up um, the Deputy Convener's question around this difference between at night and throughout the night. And I understand the comment that you've just made that guidance will go to the decision makers. I suppose I still have a slight concern, Cabinet Secretary, as how this will be interpreted by tribunals. Um, to remind members, I, I spent about 20 years on DLA and PIP tribunals. And it would seem to me on medium as a former tribunal member that you're making the test higher in regard to how often a pair would have to be up through the night. Now, I appreciate that's not your intention, and I appreciate um, you don't want that to happen. But how will that guidance be understood or passed on to the tribunal service so that we don't end up with a reinterpretation um, and goes against the policy of both the parliament and government? Well, as I said, I've, I've already stated our, our um, intent that there, there is no um, change uh, to what um, should be interpreted um, in this, um, and that obviously the guidance will be very clear. The guidance, uh, um, I should reassure again, um, I'm sure committee is aware, but is publicly available, so it's publicly available to stakeholders, to the judiciary, um, and anyone who will be um, looking um, at um, this. Um, and we're very, very determined um, to ensure that how we make decisions and the basis of our decisions um, is publicly understood, both by clients all the way up to anyone that's through an appeals um, process. Um, obviously, the judiciary have um, an absolute duty to uphold their independence um, in all of this. Um, but um, if we had, and I don't think we will, but if we had any change to how this is being interpreted, we could, of course, re revisit this, and that's one of the aspects um, that we're, we are very determined to do: is keep a very close eye on monitoring what's happening, about any changes that will be happening, and in, in when this goes live and it's actually being used as, as a live benefit. And the monitoring of those decisions um, will be a very, very important part of that process. But as, as I said at the start, um, we um, have not intended, do not think there is, and particularly with, with the guidance behind the regulations. Um, any um, change to, to this. So, so can I then just clarify or seek clarification, Cabinet Secretary, why change the words? If there is no need of change of policy, why are you using a different type of wording than what everyone is used to and everyone understands within the third sector and within um, the, the service? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this comes down to one of the challenges as we've been drafting this um, very large part of the, the, the regulations, and the regulations, as you will see this morning, are, are sub substantial. There are aspects where we can follow the exact working, uh, wording. There's examples um, where um, we haven't. It's a simple matter um, of drafting as we've gone um, through this process. But as we've gone through the, the process of drafting, this has been um, obviously um, part of a very um, long engagement with stakeholders about our intent and how we intend to, to draft these regulations and what, what goes in them. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of drafting rather than a, a change of, of policy. Um, and I suppose I would also point to the fact that um, SCOS, as they deliberated these um, 
regulations it didn't raise any concerns or issues um, around this area as well, which I hope reassures the committee on this. Uh, but I appreciate that Mr. Balfour, um, you know, has a keen interest in this and, and remains um, concerned about it. Um, and, and I would again point to the fact that we will monitor this very, very closely to ensure um, that our intent is what's carried out. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you. Good to move on, Jeremy. Uh, Pauline McNeil, we'll bring you back in for the next team. Um, thank you, convener. Um, so this uh, next set, of, well, next question I have is in relation to late requests for redetermination. Um, so the regulation allows for forty-two days to ask for a redetermination or up to a year with good reason. So that's my question. So you'll know, cabinet secretary, that in the DLE regulations, the time limit is thirty-one days, and uh, it can be extended to thirteen months. Um, in practice, decision makers at the DWP rarely refuse to accept a late request for a decision made within the absolute time limit. So that's that 13 months. Uh, my question is: um, Would you be encouraging, therefore, um, Social Security Scotland guidance to encourage decision makers to be lenient in their judgments, or are they going to be given any guidance as what constitutes good reason for a late request for redetermination? Or is that something you just intend to build upon as we go forward? I think it would be quite useful to get um, your answer to that. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, use, I wouldn't use the word lenient. Um, I would probably use the word fair, um, a, a fair assessment of, of what's happening to this and a, and a fair approach. Um, and that very much involves um, the um, agency staff listening to clients, um, understanding the reasons why they have made the request for a, a late determination. So, in essence, we have actually increased um, the timelines for requesting a redetermination from that one month um, within the DWP system to 42 days within the devolved um, system. Both systems, as Paul McNeil says, do accept um, late determinations of that. And uh, again, I would go back to how we're running our entire social security system um, and the principles that it's based on around dignity, fairness, I, and respect. Um, the, the case managers, decision makers, aren't, aren't there to to catch clients out and to make life um, difficult for clients. They are there, as I said, at start to make a fair uh, decision on this. It, this will very much be based on um, guidance, as the committee would expect, um, and I think that guidance. Um, will again reassure um, stakeholders and clients uh, that this will be done very much in, in a fair manner. Obviously, with the guidance that we do within the agency, we try very hard to work with stakeholders as we draft that guidance to ensure that it is fit for purpose um, and that um, we do allow for fair decision making through that. And I would expect that work with stakeholders to be as um, um, as on this issue, as it has been on, on many other um, issues. But I suppose, again, the detail will be in the guidance that, that falls behind um, some of the regulations. But again, I would reassure the committee that we work with stakeholders on the drafting of this, that the guidance does not just come up uh, as a kind of fait accompli to, to, to stakeholders. Um, and that is the way that we ensure that we make those fair decisions um, for people that genuinely do take account of a, a client's um, needs and a client's situations as, as we go through this. Because, in essence, we all want to ensure that every individual who comes forward to the, to the agency gets the benefits and the payments that they are entitled to. And we can only do that if we make the decisions in a fair manner. And that, of course, um, also involves um, any issues around late requests for redeterminations or a, a, a myriad of other things for that matter. I just just um just wanted to be clear. So Cabinet Secretary, you're saying there will be guidance on the use of the twelve months and uh, a reasonable use. There will be yes. guidance on that. Yes, there, there there certainly wouldn't be situations where case managers um would be in a position where they're making that decision themselves without the ability to refer back to to guidance. So we've we've made um, we've made um, very, very um, good progress with the uh, guidance that we have on this about what does constitute good reason. As I say, we've worked with stakeholders um, on that because we want to be transparent to stakeholders about how those decisions are, are made. So any decision that um, 
um, anybody would make on these issues would absolutely be based on the guidance that we've worked with stakeholders on as we've drafted it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pauline. Uh, Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'd like to ask about the right to review. Um, so, can I ask, you know, requesting a review for an award is obviously very important because a child's condition might worsen, or it may be that it comes to light that relevant information that should have been in the application wasn't. Um, there's a lot of DLA and PIP underpayment at the moment due to worsening conditions not being acted on. So, uh, you know, I'm sure you'll agree that it's vital we get this right. But we have been advised by SPICE and by witnesses that there is no absolute right to a review in the child disability payment regulations. And the regulations say that ministers must make a determination if they believe it possibly may change the award. But this seems to leave open the possibility that a review request might not be accepted. And because no determination has been made, there is no right to appeal that. So can I ask, is the Scottish Government's intention that anyone making a request for a review should get one? And if so, should that be more explicit in the regulations? Um, so we have lowered the threshold as we've gone through this process um, around notification of a change of circumstances from a client, um, from probably to possibly, as Alison Johnson um, has said. Um, and I think that's very important that we've got that threshold there because it, in essence, um, sets an appropriate level um, for um, um, decisions um, to be made. Um, if I could perhaps go through the, the process of, of this. So, for example, a, a client would uh, report a change of circumstances um, to, the, to the agency. Uh, the client will get a fresh determination of entitlement um, following that, and that will tell them whether uh, things will stay the same, whether they will increase or whether they will decrease. Um, the client has a, a right to request a redetermination or indeed an appeal um, if, if they wish to um, at, at that point. So um, I think it's, it's important to have a process where um, case managers have um, a, a, a level of threshold that they will look at um, to make those decisions. And as I say, we've changed that from probably to possibly. Um, which um, changes that threshold. Um, but if um, a case manager has determined, for example, that, um, that there shouldn't be a change um, in um, an award and has that determination of entitlement that goes out saying things will stay the same, um, as I said, that the client will have the ability to request a, a redetermination. Um, or indeed an appeal, if that's um, a process. So hopefully that um, um, reassures the committee that um, a person can go back um, and um, can go back and and challenge. And, and again, I would go to the, to the to the to one of the key points around how social security is um, is working, and that it is actually there to ensure that an individual gets the maximum benefit that they are entitled to. And that's one of the, the responsibilities of case managers as they go through this, is to ensure that someone gets the maximum that they're entitled to. So we're not out there and case managers aren't sitting there with guidance to look to minimise awards or to look to, to minimise someone's ability um, to come forward. What we actually want to do is encourage people to come forward with change of circumstances and encourage people to know that there is a system out there that they can trust and will be supported as they go through that process so that they will get what they're entitled to um, at, at the end of it. So hopefully that kind of um, reassures Alison Johnston that it, the way that the system um, is entirely built, right from the principles in the Act all the way through the guidance that case managers will have, is to actually challenge themselves to see what the client is entitled to and to ensure that they do everything they can to get the, the, the maximum that a client is entitled to. Yeah, I, I very much welcome um, the Cabinet Secretary's language and 
um, determination that we should be seeking to optimise people's incomes, make sure that they do receive what they're entitled to. So, just for absolute clarity uh, for the committee, um, you're saying that there's no danger of a child's condition worsening and it not being possible to obtain a review. Well, well I think sec section um, 52 of the Act, um, I think, um, sets out the circumstances in which we should make a determination without application. And once that threshold is met, we're under a legal duty to go on to make a further determination. So we have within uh, the Act that was passed um, uh, the thresholds and the circumstances that are in there. Um, the regulations set out this um, change um, that we've made as we've uh, drafted the regulations from po probably to possibly. Um, and again, I go back to the way that the guidance and the entire ethos of the agency is set up to ensure um, that people will get the maximum that they're entitled to. On the on the, the probably and possibly issue, um, the SPICE briefing and witnesses have raised the issue of whether the duty to act on information that could possibly lead to a change of an award could, in practice, result in frequent reconsiderations of a child's award, in, con in contrast to the policy intention of rolling awards. Um, are you satisfied that this isn't going to be the case? Yeah, and I think this is an, an interesting point because what, what we're what we're trying to do is absolutely ensure, um, as I've said in my previous answer, that we give the maximum opportunity to allow people to come forward with changes to circumstances and have redeterminations if, if that's um, required. But um, we're also very aware that because of people's experience of the current system, they find any review process. Um, um, stressful and a very anxious time. So while um, we will look at these um, options as we go through, we've been really clear that we won't review clients' awards unnecessarily, um, because we want to reduce that that stress. So if we decide to review um, an award early, we'll have to give the clients reasons about why that's the case and why that's um, happening. Um, and case managers, again, go back to the guidance, will have very clear guidance about how to, to handle relevant changes of, of circumstances. Um, so, for example, we've been very clear that um, changes such as moving into work, which might not be entirely relevant to the vast majority of people on CDP, but, but I give this as an example, changes such as moving into work won't automatically result in a loss of entitlement. Um, because we've recognised that there are concerns in the current system about how there are assumptions made, for example, by moving into work. So this is a, a balance um, that we've um, got got to, to strike in here. But we are very clear that what we are building is a system where people are encouraged to come forward, so they get the maximum entitlement, but that we, the agency doesn't step in and review unless. Um, it, there is um, a reason for them to do that, and as I say, we have to justify that reason to the client as well. And we'll monitor the amount of times that we come in early um, and re review an award early as well. So again, we'll be transparent about how many times this happens, so that we can ourselves challenge ourselves, but I'm sure stakeholders and others will challenge too if we feel that we're in. We're doing that too often because that's absolutely not the intent. So we'll monitor that really closely. Can I just ask one final quick question on the yeah on the question of you information with respect to the specific issue of missing information? Will there be a clear process for the parents or guardian to ask for a review on the grounds that information was missing for whatever reason the first time round for that information to be provided? Well, if, if information comes to light that wasn't available when um, a decision was being made, for example, that that would actually um, entitle the child to um, a higher award, we can revisit the, that earlier decision to correct that. That's entirely consistent with what's in the Act, and um, that that would be in place for us to be able to, to work that through. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. My apologies to Mr. Balfour. We're pushed for time, not able to let you in at, at this point, and we'll move on to the next team, Tom Arthur. 
Cabinet Secretary. This is just a relatively um, brief line of questioning. The uh, priority for transition from DLA to CDP is the arising 16 cohort, who in about 18 months' time will start to turn 18 themselves. My question is around transition to adult disability payment, which I understand is to come online from summer of next year. However, can I just ask what contingencies um, will be put in place in the event that ADP is delayed? Well, we certainly don't anticipate there being any further um, delays to, to ADP. Our respective officials, both within Scottish Government and the DWP, um, are um, working on um, ADP um, at this um, point and are taking forward the really detailed uh, planning that they have to do um, for that. So the timescales that um, I set out to Parliament some months ago, um, we still believe are a, a fair judgment to, to when this can be delivered. Um, of course, if um, those changed over time, we would then build in contingencies, but we don't feel that that's uh, necessary at this point because I'm confident about the, the timescale for delivery. And just as a quick supplementary, Cabinet Secretary, if there were contingencies required, would it be perhaps along the line of allowing people to move to a change benefit before 18, or allowing people to continue on CDP after they've turned 18? Um, well, I won't speculate on the um, you know, hy hypothetical contingencies that we would have in place, but I suppose what I could say um, is what we are actually doing to ensure that people. Um, um, have an ability to, to move between CDP and, and ADP uh, without there being any gaps in that. So, for example, um, a, a young person would be able to stay on CDP um, if they are um, over 18, if they are still waiting on a decision for ADP. So that is the way that we will work through this in the current situation. As I say, I am I'm, I'm not going to kind of speculate on possible contingencies at this point. I don't, I don't think that would be um, fair uh, for the committee to, to hear something that, that hasn't been worked through, um, as we do with all our contingencies. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. No further questions, Convener. Thank you very much, Mr Arthur. We'll move on to the next theme. Get trying to keep some interest from members here. We'll take Shona Robinson to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Oh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Um, just on the, the, the pilots, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, first of all, very pleased that, that Dundee is, has been identified as a, a pilot. Can you say a bit more about how information from the pilot will be gathered and used to inform the, the national rollout? And after the national rollout, what kind of monitoring data Social Security Scotland is going to collect on a child disability payment to ensure the rules are being interpreted as expected? And that the administrative systems are working as expected. Okay, so, so pilots are a very normal part of the process of, of going live with a, such a, a large benefit change um, such as this, and it will give us that opportunity to ensure that the processes, the systems, and the, the links between other services, particularly the, the interdependencies between um, the agency and DWP, um, are, are working well. Um, and it's much better to test that at low pilot level numbers where contingencies place rather than at a full national rollout in, in one go. Um, we will obviously keep a very close eye on how that's working and we have the ability within the pilot um, to make um, changes um, as required of any of those processes and systems and links um, aren't working. And obviously, to see what then would go into more continuous improvement, which would be done um, once the national rollout has been completed. So we'll look very carefully at what's going on um, during that, that um, from a kind of process and systems point of view. But we'll also work very closely with clients. So um, client applications will have um, um, an ability for us, particularly online. Um, to report, for example, any faults in the form. So that's coming back directly from individuals, although I would stress this has been user tested to the nth degree already before it gets to that stage, but that, that ability is still there. Um, and we also have the, um, the option for people to, to leave um, um, the rating of their experience as they go through this process. And there's an open comment text box as well so that they can um, go through that. We do know as well we'll have to do some more kind of qualitative work with a, a representative group of applicants, so that's um, also um, plan two. 
And of course, as we go through this, we'll work really closely with stakeholders um, as this, as the committee would expect, as we've done right from the start of this process um, during that pilot process, and indeed after national rollout as well, so that we can understand how the, the delivery is working for people at that point. So hopefully that reassures committee that we're taking the the pilot very seriously as a, as a an opportunity to uh, to test, to to review, and um, to to change anything that will enhance the client experience even further than than we believe we already will be doing on day one. Thank you. That's very helpful. I was about to ask you about the evaluation and stakeholder involvement, but you've answered that uh, extensively. Um, can I ask? Uh, Will the Scottish Government expand the remit of the independent review of, of ADP to include CDP? No, I, I don't intend to do that, and, and the, the reasons for that are, 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 I hope, reasonably clear to, to committee. There is um, understandably a, a lot more concern around um, ADP, um, or certainly PIP, uh, uh, um, as it performs at the moment, and some um, a real desire to see. Um, more substantial change than we can achieve as we move to safe and secure. When we're looking at CDP, the main issue which comes back is around making the application process um, easier um, and simpler for people to, to understand. And we believe we've, we've done that um, through the changes that we've made um, already. I, I do appreciate that there's some stakeholders that, that want to have a, a kind of wider review that might look at like whole, whole life benefits, etc. But if we're starting to look at that, then it would obviously impact on the ability for us um, to deliver any changes, because changes in benefits take a long time from policy development, or indeed from an independent review, to then back into government for policy development, to programme testing, to implementation. And if we extend that still further, I am concerned that we wouldn't make the changes that some people might want us to make in AD later on um, than, than they're planned at, at this point. Okay. Uh, just finally, um, uh, Convena, can I just ask, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you've just um, uh, alluded to the, one of the lessons as being about simplifying the forms. Are there any other lessons that have been learned from developing uh, CDP that the government and, in fact, Social Security Scotland may apply to forthcoming benefits? Um. I suppose the major one um, is, is something which probably won't come as a surprise to the committee, but the, 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 requ the, the ability for us to work with clients from the current DWP system and work with stakeholders um, really closely so that we're co-designing and co-producing work is, I think, um, integral to where we've got to a point where I am very confident that we've made the changes to CDP that will make this um, a much um, a much better experience for families who are having to go through the process of filling these forms in. So um, it's it's something which might not be a new lesson, I, I, I guess, but it really does strike home when we're looking at something like this about how important it is to do that work with clients right from the start, and most importantly, to actually act on what they say as well, of course. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. The points that you just answered there. Can you describe um, what you mean by the uh, the systems and links and interdependency between DWP and Social Security Scotland? What could you foresee as being an issue with, with, with those links? So, um, obviously, as committee will be aware, um, we are effectively sharing clients with the DWP as we go through this, um, which is why it's a joint programme um, during this. So we are connecting um, um, in many different ways with different parts of the DWP system. Some of those systems are, 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 are quite frankly quite old, um, and some of them are, are newer, um, and all of those interdependencies. Um, um, must join well together, seamlessly together, actually, because that is how um, clients will receive, um, for example, passported benefits and entitlement that are still reserved, um, or indeed um, ensure that the DWP um, has 
um, knowledge of, you know, a pure and simple fact that actually an individual has been given um, an award of CDP and therefore a myriad of things have to still happen in the reserved benefit section um, for this to work. So it's a really complex piece of work. This isn't just a um, one information system going back and forward to, to, to um, between the agency and the DWP. It's um, a very complex um, relationship and a very a great number of interdependencies as, as well. It's not, you know, the DWP system isn't one system that, that, that just sits there. It's a myriad of different systems. And of course, we need to connect with um, HMRC, for example, as, as well. So there's a number of dependencies that, that we have um, with uh, different parts of government that need to be tested as we go through this, as indeed would happen if the DWP introduced a brand new benefit and it was linking into different parts of the overall DWP. Okay, but in general, I suppose my point is, do you foresee any issues with um, the the interdependency of, you, you talked about the old systems, I, I presume you mean um, software systems, um, but obviously there's that link as well, that human link, uh, but do you see any issue with uh, data transfer? Um, well, I think this is what comes down to the work that has to happen between the DWP and Social Security Scotland um, way before benefits actually get to a, a go-live process, so that we're testing all those um, abilities. And I go back to the fact that this, this is, has to be a joint project where the DWP um, are working as hard as Social Security Scotland to ensure that those are, are working. So we've ex tested extensively with the DWP to test all those um, links, um, but there's only so much that can be done before a system goes fully live. So you can take testing to certain points, but other aspects um, um, have to be done in the kind of live system. So I'm very confident that the work that both the agency have done um, and or the program has done and uh, the DWP have done means that it's working well. We certainly don't anticipate any problems. Everything is going through um, the procedures and uh, gatekeeping um, um, at all levels to ensure that it's, it's working well. But you have to have that live system as well, and that's why we have the pilots. So if there are any issues, it's on a small number of cases that can be dealt with um, with uh, manual workarounds, for example, until those have been sorted out. But well, that, it's just yeah. we don't anticipate. Yeah, thank you. And that leads me nicely on to um, some of the areas that the witnesses, uh, well, concerns, I suppose, that the witnesses brought up, um, which no doubt you will be aware of, which is actually getting the right data, actually collecting the right data. So to make the pilot um, worthwhile, it's, it, you know, they wanted to see or be reassured that, um, that the remit was correct. So, for example, they said, uh, they wanted to know why claims were being refused, um, where the requests for reviews are being turned down to ensure that Regulation 31 is working. And so I just wanted um, to give you the opportunity to reassure those uh, witnesses that, that, that the right data is being collected. Well, absolutely. And I think one of the ways that this can be done is actually by the length of the pilot, because obviously the, the, the the, the vast majority of, of monitoring that we'll be doing is, is at the start around brand new applications, but because of the length of the pilot, we'll be able to test um, all the way through. So once decisions are made, um, how are determination is being dealt with and so on. So we should be able to test um, this all the way through. And it is every single step of that process that, that we will look at as, as we, we go through this. Um, it, every step of that process is brand new, and, and therefore every step will be getting um, analysed and, and monitored as, as we go through. Not just the, you know, the number of applications and did the applications come through and did the um, did the interfaces work, but actually uh, how did that feel to the client? How did that work to the client? How did that feel for the case manager? Um, and obviously, we'll keep very close uh, contact with the DWP to ensure. Um, that their um, experiences are working as indeed we've, we've planned them um, to, to do. But I, I would say that there's been very good contact with the DWP as we, we went through this process and both governments are um, are persuaded that we are at the right stage to be able to go through with the pilots and the, and the go-live dates. Finally, uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, in response to Shona Robertson, you said that 
you're unlikely that you'll extend um, the remit of the independent review, which is currently on adult disability uh, payments, to include um, CDP. But um, one of the witnesses had said um, that the regulation could be open to interpretation and that the balance uh, between the guidance and the uh, regulation needed to be right. And I wondered how you would respond to, to that concern. Well, I suppose the, the remit of the independent review of ADP is to, to question um, whether there are major substantive changes that need to be made to, to, to ADP. But um, just because CDP isn't part of that doesn't mean that it's um, not part of our test and learn and, and uh, system. We're very, very responsive to the fact that once we go live, um, with a benefit, we continuously have to work with stakeholders to see how that works. So, um, the independent review of, of ADP is, is looking at a particular um, issues, um, but um, to do with ADP and to the kind of wider aspects and challenges that people might have um, around, um, particularly how we are um, keeping some of the same eligibility. But we will obviously still be looking very closely at CDP to ensure that there's learning. Um, that, that needs to be done, then, then we do that. So um, we will absolutely be working with stakeholders as we go through this, both during the pilot and after the pilot, after the go live, to monitor what's happening in terms of um, how this is actually working, to ensure that, that we've got the regulations um, right, all the way down, very importantly, to actually um, the client experience as, as we go through this as well. So uh, hopefully I could reassure that the witnesses that you know that that, that um, had concerns about this that we still very much will be in a learning process around CD and very keen to work with stakeholders as we go through that to see if any changes we need. It may be to regulations, it may be to guidance, um, it may be to the way that um, uh, that the agency is dealing with certain issues. Uh, but that will absolutely all be looked at after go live. Thank you. Just checking, you want to still come in, Jeremy? No. We're having struggling hearing you. Even if you could just um, indicate in the chat box whether you want to come in, Jeremy, um, and we'll persevere to get you in. If not, we'll move on. Yes, you do. Okay, so hopefully, get your sound. Can you hear me now, Camino? Perfect, thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. If I can move us on slightly, um, Cabinet Secretary, just to um, uh, uh, another point that has been raised actually at the cross party group on disability, and this is kind of looking forward to where we go next. Um, and that is around when a benefit comes to an end or a change of circumstances happens that the benefit will come to an end. And um, there has been concern. Um, from quite a number of parents that came to a cross-party group to say, we suddenly lose the car, we suddenly lose the benefit, which affects the whole family. And although you're having, you don't want to cliff edge, once that review has taken place and once the appeal system has happened, you do lose the car at some point. And has there been any thinking within Scottish Government to make a kind of taper system where rather than just you have the cliff edge, you might have a six-month or nine-month Kind of period where people can readjust to that change in circumstances. I appreciate that's not for today, but I just wondering, as you were looking at these regulations, did you think about that? Well, I think what we have put in place um, with the regulations is something to ensure that if the people have concerns about the decision that's been made, that um, short term assistance is available to allow them to move through. The determinations and appeals um, process um, without fear of losing their benefit at, at, at that point. Um, so, therefore, um, an individual can be reassured that they can go through that process and still be receiving um, the payments um, that they were entitled to before any change um, was was made um, in entitlement from from the agency. 
um, that that um, would include as well the, the motability car as we go through that too. Okay, thank you, uh, Camille. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, Jerry, thank you very much for your brevity. That, that, that's appreciated importantly in the questioning, of course, but we are a little bit pushed for time. That does conclude uh, Agenda I Item 1. <laughs> uh, we, now, we now move to Agenda Item 2, uh, which is uh, still on the same item of subordinate legislation. Can I invite uh, Ms Somerville to move the motion S5N24149 that the Social Security Committee recommend that the Disability Assistance for Children and Young People Scotland Regulation 2021 draft be approved. Could you move that now, Ms Somerville? Move, Thank you. Uh, we, we now get to the, the, the part of the session where, in theory, where we can have a debate on, on this. We've got a pretty good cut at the evidence here during the, 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 the session. If anyone would like to comment uh, for the purpose of debate, could they indicate in the chat box now, please? I know it is important. I, I, I have been hoping against hope that we may not have a debate, but it is important members put on record what, what their thoughts and considerations are. So I thank members for that. I've got two indications of interest. We've got Jeremy Balfour and then Paulie Meaning. Um, thank you, Camilla. I, I appreciate time is tight, but I think it is important that we acknowledge uh, where we have got to in regard to this. Um, this has been um, a, a five year process which has gone through lots of consultation. Uh, and clearly, where we are is something that we, I'm sure, across the different parties, uh, welcome and, and hope that they are successful. And um, I suppose just to to put on record, I, I do still have concerns in regard to the definition in the round night time, and I'm still I understand what the cabinet secretary has he said, but I'm not quite sure yet why they felt we need to change the wording for that. Um, everyone understood it, and um, it has been working well. Uh, for the last number of years, and so I, I, I do think that may have to be revisited at some point. The other area that I still have concerns around is in um, regard to reviews taking place uh, by the new agency. Um, I appreciate that the um, cabinet secretary again says that she wants a light touch, and that there has to be evidence to show we need for the review. Um, however, it is still unclear to me when a review would take place, um, where would that evidence come from to start that kind of review, and um, will the agency have to go on fishing trips to find that? And that does seem to me unclear. Now, that may become clearer once we have the guidance um, and once the system is up and running, uh, but I do still have two, con two concerns around that. Uh, but in general, uh, convener, I welcome uh, these regulations, um, I hope they uh, will give the uh, security that children and their families require, um, and look forward to seeing them working in practice over the next number of years. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Balfour. Uh, Pauline McNeil. Thank you, Kevin. I'll, I'll be brief. I've already put on record that I think there's a number of good things, good measures in the regulations that should be welcomed by everyone. Um, just to emphasise, I think it's important for a future committee to keep an eye on any divergence there might be on future case law in relation to the regulations and the question that I put the Cabinet Secretary as to the phrase on redetermination being allowed for the 12 month period as opposed to the 42 days as to what um, will in time be put in the guidance. Um, as what a good reason would be in order to have a late redetermination. But with that, I'm absolutely um, happy to support the regulations. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Thank you very much, Pauline. Um, maybe just a brief comment from myself before I bring the Cabinet Secretary back in, if she wants to respond to some of that um, before we conclude. Um, I, I think the way this committee and the Scottish Government and stakeholders have engaged with the rolling out of the new child disability payment bodes well for transforming uh, Scotland's approach to entitlements for those living with disabilities uh, across all these streams, not least of all uh, adults living with disability, which will be coming shortly. So I think we're in a very good place. Uh, I thank the government for the constructive engagement and our committee, because there's not much time left in this committee in this session for all the work we have done and the earlier committees before I took over as convener of this committee. So I think we are in a pretty good place. And of course, any successor committee should be scrutinising the implementation of these uh, disability payments uh, in the real time. 
uh, that I think we've come together as a committee, uh, uh, constructively with the government and uh, as a parliament. So I'll just put that on record. My thanks to committee members for the the, the sterling scrutiny of of of, of, of the, this this, uh, the, this this these important proposals. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to respond to that brief debate? I, I wouldn't say too much, convener, because I, I, I know you're wanting to keep you tight for time here. But um, I, I would agree with committee. This is a, a milestone event, and we've quite rightly went through the, the, the details of the regulations um, today. But I think it is also important to take a, a step back and to, to recognise the point that, that we are coming to with these regulations um, being passed. Uh, I won't rehearse the, some of the, 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 the points that the, the uh, committee members have, have raised in, in that brief debate, as I think I went over them uh, during committee. But what I will say is that, um, of, of course, the guidance is, is made public that we are um, that we are um, completing for the, the agency, and you know, given where where, where we are um, in, in timescales of future committees, we're, we're, we're you know keen to investigate that guidance further once it's um, published. Then, of course, as I say, um, the we are very keen to be very transparent about that and ensure that people are reassured um, about how we are putting these regulations in, into into practice. But that's, I suppose, something uh, for the next committee and potentially for um, whoever holds this position after the election, if it's not me. Okay. Um, thank you, Cabinet. So you have joined us slightly later in 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 in, in this uh, meeting, so you, you will be returning. But uh, just for the moment, can I ask the committee to content to recommend approval of this instrument? If you're not content. Could you indicate in the chat box? There have been no uh, indication of dissent in the chat box. That is agreed. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary and your officials. I am going to move to agenda item three. The committee will now consider the disability assistance for children and young people consequential amendment and transitional provision Scotland Regulations 2021 SSI 2020 slash 73, which is subject to the negative procedure. The purpose of the instrument is to allow the child disability payment to be treated in the same way as child disability living allowance for devolved passported benefits. Members will also want to be aware that the Scottish Government intends to lay amending regulations tomorrow to correct an ambiguity in the definition of care home. Uh, can I ask members if they are content to note this instrument? Again, if, uh, if you are not content, please indicate in the chat box. Okay, uh, that is indeed uh, agreed, uh, and I, I, I did indicate that uh, the cabinet secretary would not be coming away that quickly, um, because we now move to agenda item four. I'm not here saying can we suspend very, very briefly, just to allow IT to get the cabinet secretary and and her officials' cameras uh, in working order. I don't know if that's required, but can we have a one-minute suspension? Let's not stop recording. A one-minute suspension just to. Give IT the opportunity to get the ca the cameras uh, sorted. So we'll suspend briefly.
I'll get it in. I've got to clock in. Okay, and welcome back, everyone. Uh, we now move to agenda item four, subordinate legislation. And the committee will take evidence on social security information sharing Scotland regulations 2021, which is subject to the affirmative procedure. Can I refer members to paper six? As before, this agenda item is an evidence session, not formal consideration of the motion. The officials are permitted to speak during this agenda item. Once we move to the next agenda item, formal consideration to move to approve, including in a debate that will only be members and the Cabinet Secretary who will contribute. So, can I welcome back uh, Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, and her officials Andrew Hiskett, Information Governance Policy Officer, Scottish Government, Ryan Lawrenson, Product Owner, Scottish Government, and Susan Robb, Solicitor, Scottish Government. So, welcome back, Cabinet Secretary, and can I ask you to make an opening statement once more? Thank you very much, uh, convener. Delighted to be back to talk about uh, the social security information sharing regulations this time. The transition to deliver Scottish disability benefits is a complex process involving many interactions between different government departments and agencies, as indeed we have just discussed in the previous set of regulations. And this means that information sharing between various agencies will be necessary to ensure a seamless transition and an uninterrupted delivery of benefits. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, it will be essential for Social Security Scotland to work together and share information with other agencies, such as local authorities, to enable individuals to receive all the benefits that they are entitled to from those agencies. These are referred to as passported benefits and include entitlements such as pencil tax reductions and the blue badge permits. Enabling local authorities to request information about an individual's disability benefit entitlement from Social Security Scotland reduces the burden on individuals who would otherwise have to prove their entitlement by themselves, making it easier for them to apply for and receive passported benefits. It also speeds up the application and review process for local authorities, helping individuals get the support they need sooner. The second reason information sharing is critical for the delivery of the new disability benefits is to ensure that Social Security Scotland is equipped to access information supporting an individual's application or review for a disability benefit. Supporting information may be supplied by the individual, but the Scottish Government is committed to supporting individuals who apply for benefits by gathering this information on their behalf if they choose to do so. This option makes the application or award review process less onerous and costly for the individual. Having access to all of the relevant support information will enable case managers to make an appropriate and an informed decision on an individual's case, which minimises risk for consultations. It is important to note that it is always the individual's choice to instruct Social Security Scotland to gather this information on their behalf. It is not mandatory, and the individual's confidentiality will take precedence. Social Security Scotland will only seek to gather information on behalf of an individual that is relevant to the determination of a benefit award. This can include information in relation to an individual's medical conditions, their prognosis, medications and elements of their condition or symptoms that affect their daily life. Importantly, it can also include information on the individual's need for support. The framework for information sharing has been set out in the Social Security Scotland Act 2018. The regulations provide more detail on the agencies and organisations Social Security Scotland can share information with and require information from. They also detail the purposes of information sharing. As part of this approach to information sharing, I would like to emphasise that we take the safeguarding of the privacy of individuals seriously. These regulations give us the ability to share only relevant information and no other information beyond what is necessary. Transparency and privacy have been keenly considered in the preparation of these regulations, and this means we have placed limitations on how information can be shared to ensure any necessary sharing remains proportionate, relevant, and transparent at all times. Individuals will always be given a choice before sharing of sensitive data takes place, such as details about a medical condition. We will always get explicit authorisation of the individual before requesting supporting information about them from a health board, GP practice or local authority, and this is enshrined in the regulations. Thank you, Convener. 
Um, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. We have had one indication so far of uh, a question. So can I bring in Jeremy Balfour? Any other indications could you put in the chat box, please? Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavita, uh, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I welcome these regulations. Um, two quick questions, just on practicalities. Uh, the first one is around GPs. We had evidence last week that some GPs do charge to give medical evidence, and that sometimes has to be paid by uh, the person making the claim. Presumably, that will go, but are GPs aware of this, and how will that work in practice? If a GP still want, would want payment, and the second question is, sometimes the GP is not the best person to get the evidence from. It's not a health kind of official. It's maybe a carer or somebody else like that. And there was some concern expressed again last week that the agency would just go for the easy option, e.g., the GP or the consultant. But can you again reassure us that in guidance, the agency will look to get the best evidence, and that might not necessarily be somebody that we have a formal agreement. With. Thank you. Jeremy, thank you for rolling those questions together. That was very helpful also, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, certainly, if I can take the um, the, the first um, question, um, yes, we will be paying um, GPs for this, um, and we are working um, with um, stakeholders um, on that, about the cons um, to GPs um, on that. Um, so hopefully that deals with that issue. On the second aspect, um, it, I, I suppose I would say it's not the easiest option if we're going to the wrong person. Um, so an individual, a client, can um, let the Social Security Scotland uh, know who they believe the formal information um, should be obtained um, from. Um, they know who's best to be able to they tell the agency um, about them and to answer the relevant questions um, about them, um, and we'll take on board what the client says because we, we can't approach people uh, unless the, the client um, has um, um, has given permission for us to approach someone, um, and we want to get the right person, um, and that actually allows us to make um, the quickest um, decision. Um, for for the client, so I think on on all of those counts, it, it actually benefits the agency as well as, of course, benefit the client. Um, if we go to the person who the client believes it uh, knows them best, understands them best, and as Jeremy Balfour says, that is often not a GP. Um, it can be um, um, another person who perhaps works um, and um, um, has a, a closer relationship with with the client than than the GP can. So hopefully that reassures on both points. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Rachel Hamilton. Thanks, uh, Convener. It's, it's quite a niche question, Cabinet Secretary. Um, but the reference to the regulations that set out the um, uh, the, the the process for uh, application to blue badge. How easy? Is it to change the regulations? Because of my understanding, um, in my own um, campaign to extend the accessibility to individuals with, for example, motor neuron disease to get a blue badge, I am having to go through a process of a of a of a study which is is in conjunction with Transport Scotland. So I just wanted to really tease out. Um, the limitations of these regulations and how those can effectively be changed, or indeed, do they need to be changed to reflect the accessibility to a blue badge? Um, so it's perhaps something that that we can take um, after this committee if if this doesn't deal with the question. But I'm 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 going to say at this point that this isn't really to do with the regulations within Social Security Scotland, but actually. How the blue badge system it, itself works up, you know, is a person entitled to a, a blue badge, and therefore Social Security Scotland will be able to um, um, to be able to answer um, and respond to any request from a, a local authority um, who is dealing with um, the, the blue badge. So I, I would um, I would probably reflect that back onto um, other parts of government to ensure that um, the blue badge system is working effectively. 
and what the information sharing does um, with Social Security Scotland is ensure that whatever is in place is dealt with effectively and efficiently, and, and that's what these regulations and what the agency's responsibility is for. But um, um, I would presume that um, the effectiveness of a blue, how well the blue badge scheme um, works, is a matter for, uh, for example, um, Transport Scotland. Thank you. Okay, um, I see another bid for a question from our Deputy Convener Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Convener. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to put on record um, the purpose of the regulations, um, which I know you did address, but this is quite to me. It would probably maybe be useful for the future committee to look at this more in depth. On the face of it, it appears to be something which is going to be very helpful to applicants, and that's its primary purpose. But I'm just a little bit cautious because sharing of information and privacy issues are really important to get right. I just wonder if you could just put on the record for my satisfaction that that is the primary purpose. Protecting people's privacy, um, so they will get a say in the sharing of the information, and that the purpose of sharing is to help the applicant and uh, it, for no other purpose. But absolutely, it's it, it's it's there to assist the client as they go through this journey. I mean, I, I suppose if you can imagine what it would be like if we didn't pass these regulations, um, mm -hmm. in that the client themselves would then have to uh, go to different agencies. To get the support and information that they require, uh, the client would have to also put um, extra work into their ability to get passported benefits and so on, um, as as well. Rather than that being a process um, where it's shared, but I absolutely uh, take Colin McNeill's point that the sharing of information is something that needs to be taken really seriously and should only be done when the clients are aware. Um, and have agreed for it to be happening, um, know the reasons for it happening, um, and for them to have an ability to share um, any concerns that, that they have um, for, for that. So I would um, absolutely associate myself with the remarks that she made there. Thank you. I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Kimina. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Uh, there being no other questions, we will move to the next agenda item, which is agenda item five, uh, which is. Uh, the motion to approve the piece of support legislation which we are considering. So, can I invite Ms. Arvold to formally move the motion S5M 24148 on the Social Security Committee recommendations that the Social Security Information Sharing Scotland Regulation 2021 be approved? Could you uh, move that just now, Ms. Arvold? Move, Convener. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, it, it's procedural, um, and hope upon hope we will not be having a debate on this issue. But I want to stifle debate. Anyone wishing to make any comments at this stage? Could you indicate in the chat box? Okay, I don't don't see any any wish uh, to do that. Um, I, I I suspect then there's there's no requirement for the cabinet secretary to 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 sum up at, at this stage, given there wasn't a debate. Thank you. Um, can I ask, is the committee uh, content to recommend the approval of this instrument? Again, unless I see dissent in the chat box, I'll assume that's approved. Okay, that is approved. Now we move to agenda item six. Uh, and the committee will take uh, evidence on two affirmative instruments together. That is the Social Security Operating Scotland Order 2021 and the Social Security Operating Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations. Also, 2021. Can I refer members to paper nine? And can I once again welcome Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security, and older people, and her officials Camilo Arredondo, eh, Vanna Anastasiandu. Eh, uh, so I should just put their titles eh, on record. There. My apologies, Camilo is Solicitor, Scottish Government, and Vanna is Economic Advisor, Scottish Government. My apologies to you both, um, and to Veronica Smith, Cross Cutting Policy Advisor. Scottish Government. Uh, as before, um, we will invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a, an opening statement, and then we will move to questions. Cabinet Secretary. This is an opportunity to assist the Committee with its considerations of the draft order and draft regulations that are required 
upgrade devolved social security benefits in April 2021. As you know, we took over executive competence of the remaining disability benefits and industrial injuries benefits on 1st April 2020. And as a result, we are responsible for bringing forward the legislation to update all those benefits, including carers allowance, which we have had responsibility for since 2018. <clears throat> as you can see from the draft order before you, there is an extensive list of benefits and associated benefits, particularly with the industrial injury scheme and the severe disablement allowance. The Section 77 report, which was laid in the Scottish Parliament on 29 January, sets out the impact of inflation on the devolved assistance and what we intend to do for the next financial year. This report was extended to include all the devolved benefits, and I hope it helps assist the committee in understanding the complexity of the benefits we are now responsible for updating. As required under agency agreements with the Department of Work and Pensions, the draft order updates these benefits through the uprating policy of September CPI, which was 0.5 per cent this year. <clears throat> the only exception is the industrial death benefit, which is a form of pension, which is to be uprated by 2.5 per cent under the triple lock guarantee. I should now turn to our own benefits. There is a duty to uprate the Young Carer Grant and Funeral Support Payment by inflation in 2021-22, which would have resulted in a 0.5 per cent increase. However, due to the exceptional circumstances arising from COVID-19, I decided to increase not only Young Carer Grant and Funeral Support Payment, but also the Best Start Grant, Child Rental Heating Assistance and Job Start Payment by 1 per cent. Cross in its published report stated that they welcome this decision. It reflects information that we have sourced on the impact of COVID on some low-income households, and it maintains and slightly enhances the system's contribution to the realisation of certain human rights and the reduction of poverty. I also note that Scott questioned the implications of this decision for the Scottish, long, Scottish Government's long-term policy to uprating. I would like to take this opportunity to re-emphasise that our annual uprating policy is unchanged and remains focused on ensuring that payments keep pace with price inflation, as reflected by the September CPI. However, I think the Committee would agree that we are in an exceptional circumstances this year with the impact of COVID-19. And I wish to respond accordingly and provide a 1 per cent increase. In the budget session two weeks ago, we discussed the other measures the Scottish Government has taken to support people during this time, and this 1 per cent increase should be seen as part of that overall package. The draft regulations before you will bring this 1 per cent increase into effect, other than from the job start payment, which will be increased administratively. Carers Allowance Supplement Statement within the Section 77 report confirms that the supplement will be updated by September CPI of 0.5 per cent. Section 81 of the Social Security Act does not allow the payment to be increased higher than the rate of inflation. However, this supplement, together with the Carers Allowance, will provide recipients in Scotland with up to £462.80 more a year than equivalent carers in England and Wales in 2021-22. Combining carers allowance and carers allowance supplement, this gives a total investment of 348 million in carers through social security. And finally, I hope that next year, when we re revisit the annual uprating process, the worst of this pandemic will be behind us, and the measures we have introduced will have made a real difference to people's lives. Happy to take questions, Kimberly. Okay, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I just? Uh, Check. Does any member have any questions to raise at this point? The Alison Johnson has indicated, along with Rachel Hamilton. Alison, we'll take you, and then we'll take Rachel. Um, thank you, convener. Thank you, cabinet secretary. I'd just like to um, understand why Best Start Foods doesn't go up at all. You know, so in effect, that is a, a real terms cut, surely. Uh, so, Best Start Foods um, obviously replaced the, the UK wide Healthy Start vouchers um, in Scotland. When we first introduced it, it was increased by 37% um, and um, should be seen um, both within that um, introductory increase, uh, but also the fact that uh, Best Start Foods uh, does not stand um, alone. It is not the only support that people might be entitled to. Um, we obviously have a Best Start Grant and particularly the Scottish Child um, Payment as well. Um, and when we look particularly at the other work that the Scottish Government is doing with um, in relation to the impact of COVID, there's a number of other 
um, aspects of the Scottish Government's work that will benefit those um, who will be receiving um, Best Start food. Uh, so, for both the introductory um, increase and also the other work that is going on within government, particularly around uh, the Scottish um, Child Payment, um, I looked at this in the round rather than simply just looking at Best Start Foods in isolation. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, back, Alison Johnson. Um, uh, Rachel Hamilton. The situation where the uprating wasn't carried out on the Scottish Child Payment in uh, February, but twenty one twenty two, I think I'm correct there. Um, will this have any impact on any future decisions on on comparable benefits that um, might be brought forward by the Scottish Government in terms of that uh, approach? Um, so, with apologies, I, I missed a bit of Rachel Hamilton's question. I could see her, but I couldn't see part of it. So, I'll, um, if I don't get it right, you can tell me, you can tell me again. Um, we took the decision um, around the Scottish Child Payment um, because it was being introduced um, in February, um, not to update it um, at, at this point because the um, important aspect that we need to be concentrating on around Scottish Child Payment is actually dealing with the applications process and those and getting them out for payment, rather than making changes to um, the programme and changes to the ways of working in the agency that might have um, detracted from the work that we are doing um, in dealing with the applications that are going through just now. So that was a decision that was taken around the Scottish Child Payment because of the circumstances that we're in and because of the circumstances of the, the, I suppose, the timing of what's happening, and we would take any other decisions um, for any future benefits um, based on the, the issues that are impacting on that benefit at, at this time. So this um, is to do with the Scottish Child Payment, when it's coming in, and the number of applications we are due to, um, to get through, and our wish uh, to concentrate on that rather than making changes to processing at this point. Hopefully and just that to, the question I have. Here. Yes, it, it, it does. Um, yes, and just to add to that, but for the comparable um, situations that you know don't involve a pandemic, you will um, have a stakeholder engagement uh, to 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 inform you of of how that um, how it could benefit an uprating on any future benefits. Is that the case? Well, as we go through the, the uprating um, process um, in future years, obviously the Scottish Child Payment will, will be uprated. Our um, decision on how we were to deal with the uprating of the Scottish Child Payment um, was something which um, we looked at as, as we moved through different committee sessions um, in the, the, the past. Um, and uh, once the Scottish Child Payment is up and running, it will, of course, um, be part of the usual um, uprating decisions that, that we make on a um, on a weekly on a um, annual basis. So it's not actually consulted on annually. I suppose it's it's done. Um, if, you, if you go back to the, the principles of the uprating, the uprating is there um, because we need to keep uprating. Uh, by price inflation each year. That's how we've determined that we'll do it. Um, stakeholders um, may have opinions um, on, on that, and um, that's part of the budget process rather than the uprating process. So hopefully that kind of splits those two aspects off where we don't consult on the uprating, but of course we'll, we'll obviously receive the views on stakeholders if, if, if they wish to make them. Thank you. Okay. Um Thank you. Um, so um, that I think there's any other questions. I'm just checking. I'm not missing anything out here. I don't see uh, any uh, further questions in relation to that. Um, I'm just. Uh, can I just check with the clerk that the next the next matter we're doing? Are we moving uh, to approve this now? Could you just drop in the chat box? I've just lost my thread a little bit. My apologies. Just taking a little bit of time. Right. 
Okay. Uh, we're going to move. So, so uh, we're now moving to agenda item seven. Yeah. Um, my apologies for that. Uh, I have a small child to deal with in the background whilst that evidence session was going on, so I did lose 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 my thread. So I just want to make sure uh, I'm at the right bit. So we have now disposed of. Uh, agenda item six and we're on agenda item seven, is that right, Anne? Okay. Uh, so I can um, I can invite agenda item seven, can I invite then uh, to move the motion S five M two four one two four that the Social Security Committee recommends the Social Security Operating Scotland Order Trade Two One Draft be uh, approved. Can you move that formally, Cabinet Secretary? Yes, Julia. Thank you. Um, if there is an opportunity to debate, if members wish to debate at this point, could they drop that in the chat box? Okay. Uh, oh, yes, we have. I can see you waving, Rachel. It's not all right, that easy. Just... Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Sorry. Just really quickly. Um... What what happens with these regulations if um, the DWP still has the um, power over the severe disablement allowance? Does that have any effect of us passing this regulation today? I just want, um, again, reassurance on that, if I may. Yeah, that, of course, is part of the debate. So we, uh, what I'll do at this point right. is the Cabinet says can deal with that during her summing up if she wishes. Are there any other comments? Okay, there have been other comments. Um, there's the opportunity for you to sum up if you wish, Cabinet Secretary, before we move to uh, a vote. Hey, I, I, I simply, I, I, to uh, try and reassure Rachel Hamilton that this um, order ensures that the uprating applies as the same as the, the DWP. So if we didn't pass the order, um, then that uprating wouldn't happen, and um, that uprating um, agreement is part of our agency agreement with the DWP. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the summing up and complete the question of the committee is the committee content to recommend approval of this instrument. Again, a letter of dissent in the chat box. We'll assume that it has been approved. Okay, that being the case, now that I actually what agenda item we are on, uh, we'll move to agenda item eight, subordinate legislation, and it's the motion to uh, 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 approve uh, another one of the motions uh, instruments we've just looked at. Uh, can I invite Ms. Somerville to move the motion S five M two four one two five that the Social Security Committee recommends that Social Security Operating Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulation 21 draft be approved. Could you move that, Cabinet Secretary? Move, Kevin. Uh, again, there is no opportunity for a brief debate if members wish to do so. Would you indicate the chat box if that is the case? Okay. Uh, so the question is that the committee is is the committee content to recommend approval of the said instrument? Again, uh, if I don't see the sent in the chat box, I'll assume that is the case. But indeed, it is. So that is approved. Um, can I therefore uh, thank the cabinet secretary and your officials, not not just the ones currently on board, but all your officials through um, the course of this rather lengthy evidence session and statute instruments, but actually. To your officials throughout the course of the parliamentary session, uh, this is likely to be the last uh, discussion we will have in this particular session, given that Parliament uh, is about is, is about to move into the, the electoral period. So, as I hinted at earlier on when we were looking at child disability payments, uh, I just want to recognise my thanks to you and your officials for all your efforts and work uh, through th through uh, the, the the years the years gone by. And uh, some of us may see some of you the other side of the election, but thank you for all your uh, collegiate working. Uh, and that uh, concludes agenda item two, uh, agenda item nine, eight, eight rather. Um, this is the perils of having a small child and an Alexa app in the background, um, which I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do with at the same time. Uh, we are going to move to agenda item nine, which is actually a private session. So you'll be relieved to know the broadcast part of this will. Be complete, and we'll move to the private session agenda item nine. So we close the public part of the meeting. <laughs>